Chapter 9 Sophie Empress Under the Boot As Sophie followed Rian, Hort trailing behind her, she could feel her heart rumbling like a drum. The weasel had done well, but until Tedros was back on the throne, their work was far from done. She needed to talk to Hort alone, but there was no chance of that. Not with Rian riding with them to the blessing and that demented eel on Hort's neck. Sophie glimpsed the horses through the window, pulling the royal carriage up the drive. Unless... No time to think. She made her move, lurching back and grabbing onto Hort's sweaty hand, ignoring his stunned expression. She'd never held the weasel's hand before. Who knew where that hand had been? But these were desperate times. Tattooed Thiago held the door open for the king as the carriage arrived. Wesley is fetching those boys from the dungeons as you ordered, sire, he said, armor glinting in the sunlight. Will you need a second carriage? The king didn't break stride. We'll all fit in one. Don't be ridiculous. A queen can't arrive at her first wedding event packed like a sardine. Hort and I can ride alone. Sophie scoffed, barreling past the king, dragging Hort like a scolded child and throwing him into the carriage that hadn't fully stopped. She fumbled in behind him, grabbing onto his rump to steady herself, and smiled back at Rian. See you at the church. Pretending to lose her balance, she ripped Hort's skim off like a strip of hot wax and flung it out the carriage door. Oh dear, she gasped before slamming the door shut. We have five seconds before he opens this door, Sophie intoned. Good news is I got Rian and Japeth fighting, Hort said, breathless. Evil news? Rian is still alive, Japeth is still his brother, and I'm still marrying a monster, said Sophie. Good. Agatha is safe at the school for good and evil, Hort contended. Evil. A team of sorcerers is on their way to help her, and I just lied to the entire woods that she's been captured, said Sophie. Good. Willem and Bogdan are about to be free. Evil, literally anyone else in that cell would have been more useful than those goons, your girlfriend included. And if the blessing goes off as planned, that means we're three events from Tedros losing his head. If Agatha is building an army, then we need more time, Hort. We need to delay the blessing somehow. Exactly, said Hort. Why do you think I picked Willem and Bogdan over everyone else? Sophie stared at him, then grinned with understanding. The carriage door swung open. Rian glowered, his face in shadow. Before Sophie could speak, a skim shot through the door and smashed into Hort, who let out a resounding shriek, sending the horses rearing. A few minutes later, Willem and Bogdan studied four tarot cards laid out in Bogdan's lap. Tower, Judgment, Empress, Death. Neither Willem nor Bogdan had time to bathe before being shoved next to Hort inside the carriage, which now reeked so badly of dungeon sweat that Sophie could hardly breathe. Sitting beside Sophie, Rian focused intensely on the two boys across from him. Meanwhile, Bogdan and Willem kept giving Sophie anxious peeks, as if they had no idea why they were here. 
but Sophie just smiled at Bogdan reassuringly, the same way she did when she expected the beady-eyed stooge to do her bidding back at school. It's a yes or no question, the king said, his teeth clenched. So let's have the answer. For the last time, is my brother trying to kill me? Bogdan looked at Willem, waiting for Willem to say something. Willem looked at Bogdan, waiting for Bogdan to say something. Say yes, Sophie thought, seeing Hort glare at them with the same message. Just say yes. That's all we need. Bogdan looked back at the cards. Well, tower and judgment side by side. That means there's bad blood between you and your brother. And the Empress card suggests a female involved. Obviously, Rian muttered, eyeing Sophie. Nor her, Willem countered, fingering the Empress card. Someone further back that made you and Jepeth distrust each other. Add the death card into all this. And there's, um, only one conclusion. He and Bogdan exchanged fretful glances. Well, what is it? Rian snapped. Bogdan gulped. One of you will kill the other. Only there's no way to know who, Willem croaked. Rian looked startled for a moment, even a little scared. So we should postpone the blessing then? Sophie chimed, delighted by the boy's performance. Can't possibly be worried about weddings with a snake trying to kill you. She knew she'd been too chipper, because Hort tensed his buttocks, and Rian gave her a suspicious look. I thought you didn't believe in all this, said the king. I thought you said they were fools. Sophie went mum. The king turned back to the two boys. Should Sophie and I still get married? Willem quickly dealt new cards. Say yes, Sophie prayed, or he'll know we put you up to this. Hmm, the cards can't say if you should marry Sophie, Willem replied, assessing his hand. But they do say you will. Not on schedule, though. Bogdan added, definitely not on schedule. Willem concurred. See, we should postpone the blessing at once, Sophie squawked, nearly hugging the two boys. It's what we're supposed to do. And tell me, will your friend Tedros be executed as planned? Rian said to the boys, ignoring his princess. Bogdan bit his lip as he found out a new hand on Willem's lap. No, he rasped, clearly relieved. Hmm, I don't know if I agree, Boggs, said Willem, touching Bogdan's arm. Knight of Cups next to death? I think it means someone will try to stop the execution. But to me, it's unclear whether they'll succeed. The king's blue-green eyes flattened. An 
And who would this nameless Avenger be? Hmm, can't say, said Willem, puffing at his red hair. But you'll meet them soon, looks like, near a holy place, with lots of people. And a priest. A blessing, and a church, perhaps, said the king witheringly. Oh dear, we should definitely postpone then, Sophie pushed weakly. But she knew the boys had laid it on too thick, for Rian was smirking now. Anything else you'd like to tell me about my nemesis? Sensing tension, Bogdan flung down new cards, but missed his own lap and scattered the whole deck over the carriage. Oopsie daisy, Willem scrambled and swiped a few cards from under Rian's boot. Um, here we are, see, magician, next to hermit. Well, based on this, your enemy will be a... He frowned. Ghost? But still mortal, Bogdan prattled pointing at a death card. And tower over death means they can fly, Willem added. Or at least levitate, Bogdan nodded. And it's a boy, said Willem. I see a girl, said Bogdan. One or the other, Willem offered. The carriage went quiet. Sophie's head was in her hands. The king leaned back. So, a ghost that's mortal who flies near a church and is of dubious sex. That's who's going to try and stop me. Well done. Sophie raised her head like a squirrel. You two really are as daft as Sophie promised the king thrashed. The second we return, you'll be thrown back in the dungeons. His eyes shot to Hort. You too, since you vouched for these fruit flies. In the meantime, you three'll be locked here during the blessing. The smell of you alone is good reason to have you out of sight. Rian glowered at Sophie daring her to protest, but she tried her best to look untroubled. Then she turned and stared out the window, her eyes welling. Every time she thought she had a way out, she found the path sealed off, the maze closing in. In the glass, she could see Rian watching her in her reflection, as a tear slipped down her cheek. She didn't bother hiding it. It didn't matter. There was no plan now. She was back where she'd started. The boys would return to jail. The blessing would continue. Tedros would die. Flying ghost or not. The boys in the carriage were subdued the rest of the way, the king included. Sophie could see Rian's lips pressed together, his eyes fixed on the Empress tarot card, which had never been retrieved from under his boot. Clearly his brother was still on his mind. Meanwhile, Hort kept glancing at Sophie, but she ignored him, while Willem and Bogdan quietly reordered their cards. For a moment, it was so silent in the carriage that Sophie could hear the eel slithering around on Hort's skin. Sophie gazed at the Empress, smiling so emptily from under the king's boot, a pawn in someone else's game. That's me. Sophie thought, a pawn at a dead end. What would Agatha do? Agatha would find a way to fight back, even from a dead end. 
Agatha would never be a pawn. Sophie's heart stirred, thinking of her best friend. How long until Kai and his men get to school? Without Lady Lesso or Dovey protecting the towers, surely they'd find their way in. Plus, Agatha had already escaped Rian's clutches once. Twice was asking too much, even for a girl who always seemed to land on her feet like a cat. Speaking of which, where was Reaper? The last she'd seen of Agatha's hideous pet was in the castle before the battle against the snake. Sophie's toes curled tighter around the vial hidden in her shoe. If she could only be alone, she could use her quest map and see if Agatha was safe or if Rian's men had apprehended her. A surging buzz drew her out of her head, and Sophie flinched, knowing she was about to glimpse the crowds for the blessing. Ironic, of course, since she'd spent her whole life coveting fame, but now felt allergic to all of it, eager to return to the castle. Alone in her bathtub, she could pretend this was a bad dream, that this wedding could never happen, that this lie would be found out. But it was outside the castle, in the presence of the people, that she knew she was wrong. Because people can make a lie real, the same way they make fairy tales real by believing in them, by passing them on, by claiming them as their own. That's why people needed the Storian to guide them, because fairy tales were powerful things. Sophie knew this from experience. Try too hard to write your own instead of letting the pen write it, and bad things happen. That was the truth. But it's easy to stop believing the truth. It's as easy as deciding to believe in a man over a pen. Thunder tremored outside, and Sophie peeked through the window as thin black clouds unfurled like tentacles over the message in the sky about Agatha's capture. For a brief moment, she perked up, wondering if the clouds were due to more than just the weather. But then the carriage veered sharply, and now the people came into view. The streets were crammed, five bodies deep, manic and unruly. A beautiful nymph with mint-green skin patterned with silver stars waved a sign, Ask me my story, King Rian, while a hideous furry creature held his own. Me mum's a cat, me dad's a troll. Want me tail? Come down me hole. There was even a gnome with a fake mustache and hulking coat, clearly trying to disguise himself. Pick me, Pinku of Gnomeland. I can't put my address because it's a secret. Everywhere Sophie looked, ordinary citizens clamoured for Lion's Mane to tell their tales, as if the story and no longer mattered replaced by a pen that finally cared about them. Rian's promise had come true. A new pen had become the wood's guiding light. No longer could Sophie tell who was good and who was evil like she'd used to. Before now, the tribes had stayed apart, identifiable not just by dress and decorum, but also by their loathing for one another. That's why the two sides had worshipped the Storian. 
a pen that only told the tales of an elite few, but also made the rest of the woods invested in the outcome, because it kept score of who was winning and who was losing, because it kept the two sides battling for glory. That is, until Rian had united them with a new pen. A pen that didn't care if you went to a famous school. A pen that gave everyone a chance at a fairy tale. Now Evers and Nevers wore the same lion masks and hats and shirts and waved cheap replicas of lion's mane. Others flashed signs with the names of Tsarina and Haristo, newly minted stars in the woods. A gang of teenagers, good and evil, hooted as they lit stacks of the Camelot courier on fire, the one touting Agatha and her army. Nearby, a delegation from Budova sang a hymn to the lion tossing roses at Rian's window. Guards in Camelot uniforms patrolled the road, keeping the mob from the carriage, and a fleet of maids in white dresses and bonnets handed out books of the tale of Sophie and Agatha, while the crowd flapped them at Sophie, trying to get her attention. These storybooks, seemed to glow under the black storm clouds, with the lettering outlined in rubies and gold. Sophie's eyes bulged. Bewildered, she slid down her window and snatched one out of someone's hands, quickly pushing the window back up. She gaped at the cover. The tale of Sophie and Agatha, as told by Lion's Mane. Sophie flipped through and saw the entire fairy tale had been retold from Rian's perspective, with beautifully drawn illustrations in blue and gold that resembled the rug in the throne room. The short storybook was scant in details, but offered the broad tale of a humble boy growing up in a small house in Foxwood with his brother Japheth, the two of them watching from afar as the legend of Agatha and Sophie spread. Despite his allegiances to good, Rian always found himself rooting for Sophie, a girl he found bold and beautiful and clever, and against Agatha, a self-righteous know-it-all who'd betrayed her best friend and taken her prince. But, in the end, it was Agatha who had the happy ending, claiming the throne of Camelot with Sophie's prince, while Sophie resigned herself to a future alone. That is where everyone thought the story ended, including Rian. Until three shadowy women came to his house in the night and told Rian the truth. That he was the real heir to Arthur, and the one true king, destined to rule the woods forever. And not only that, He'd been right about Sophie, the women revealed. It was she who deserved to be Queen of Camelot, not Agatha. It was Sophie who deserved a prince. Only he was that prince, not Tedros. Agatha and Tedros, meanwhile, were fiendish usurpers who would bring shame to Arthur's kingdom and destroy the woods. It was up to Rian as the rightful king to stop them. Rian didn't believe any of this, but the women had more to tell. Soon the day would come 
When Rian must leave his old life behind, they said. On that day, the sword would return to a stone, waiting for the one true king to free it. And he was that one true king. How could any of this be real, Rian thought. But just as the women promised, the day arrived when Excalibur returned to the stone. Rian couldn't rest until he knew if it was true, if he was really King Arthur's son, if he was the righteous ending to Sophie's story instead of Agatha or Tedros. If Excalibur had returned to the stone because of him. From there the story proceeded as Sophie had lived through it, but refracted and distorted, Rian as the lion, saving kingdoms from a deadly snake, Tedros's jealousy growing towards the lion, Agatha's jealousy growing towards Sophie, Sophie accepting Rian's ring, uniting evil and good, Rian freeing the sword from the stone. And now, Sophie was on the last page, gazing at a painting of Tedros and Agatha, beheaded bloodily, as Sophie kissed Rian, the two of them in their wedding clothes, as lion's mane glowed like a star above their heads. The End. Sophie's heartbeat jangled, her mouth dry. She didn't know what was real about Rian's story and what was lies. Everything had been twisted and spun, even the parts of her own tale, until she barely recognized herself. If the people of the woods were reading this, then any last sympathies for Tedros and Agatha would be gone along with any hope of convincing them they'd crowned the wrong king. Stomach sinking, she raised her eyes and saw Hort, Willem and Bogdan gawking down at the book with the same expression, having clearly read along. Slowly, Sophie turned and looked at Rian, who'd been watching her the whole time with a sly smirk. The carriage pulled up to the church, and the king clasped her palm gently, as if he no longer expected any resistance. Then he opened the door to a roar like thunder, and he kissed Sophie's hand, like he was her fairy tale prince.